Well, there are two things we never have enough of. There are two things that all of us wish we had more of. There are indeed two things that drive us, two things that motivate us, unlike anything else in our life. These two things, however, if we use them according to God's Word, God has promised He will bless bless us. God has promised that if we use these two things according to His Word, that He will see what we're doing and He will bless us and reward us. These two things we are either keeping from God or we are giving to God. These two things we're either trusting God with or we're not trusting God with. And these two things really do measure if we trust God a little or some or a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, these two things are time and money. Now you think about that for a moment. We all want more time. I remember years ago, a person asked me, how old would you like to live to be? And I said, well, if I can Make it to 70, 75, that'd be great. And I got to thinking, as I get closer to that age, I think I'd like to go beyond that. (laughs) We all want more time, right? We all all want more time. Let me have a little more time with my grandkids. Let me see my granddaughters get married. Let me me see, you know, uh, this happen. Let me see my newborn grandbaby. I want some more time because... I'm realizing that time really is running out. We all want more time, and we all want more money. And how many times have we said that? If I had more time, I would do this, I would go there. If I had more money, I have yet to meet meet anyone who's ever said to me, I've got enough money. No, everybody I've ever met said, you know what, I can always use a little more money. Uh, I could use a little more money to to buy this or or go there or have that. We could all use a little more time and a little more money. Why? Because time and money really are our treasures. And I get it. And most of us hate wasting time and wasting money. I've said to my wife many, many times, I hate it when people waste my time. I mean, you know that to be true, right? I mean, does anybody say, I can't wait to go to the DMV today and stand in line for five hours waiting for my driver's license? No one wakes up with a happy moment thinking those thoughts. Why? Because we hate to have our time wasted. We hate to waste our money. Why? Because it's valuable. Your time and money is limited. And because it is so important to us, hear this, Jesus comes along and says, these are the two things. These are the two things that if you manage them according to God's principles, if you manage your time and your money according to God's word, here's a promise of Jesus. Number one, if you manage it according to God's word, it will increase your faith. It will give you blessing today. If you manage your money and your time according to the word of God, you will have blessing today. Jesus says you'll have reward tomorrow. Jesus goes on to teach us it will transform how you see your present and your future, and it will help you to love others and bless others and glorify God in ways you never, ever imagined. And so Jesus comes along, and he talks about the two things that really will increase our faith and our hope and our love. These two things. Again, I realize pushes our buttons. I realize when you talk about time and money, people push back. They were pushing back against Jesus when he talked about it. I can sense most of you who are watching, you're tensing up right now. Oh, he's talking about my time. and Oh, he's talking about my money. I get it. Because here's what we know. How we spend our time and how we spend our money, that's personal and that's intimate. And Jesus knows that wherever these two topics are mentioned, people really do tense up. They push back. But the truth is this. If we apply, if we take Jesus' counsel in these areas, if we take Jesus' counsel about these two areas, then our faith grows. And we are blessed, and God is glorified. Jesus knows these are the two areas that we treasure the most. I get it. We understand that, again, your finances and your time, 
These are the things you treasure. Why do we treasure them so much? Well, we treasure our finances, first of all, because it represents our security. I get it. I have family. You have family. And they see their money as their security. And in some ways it is. However, note this well. Money is limited in providing security. Well, Mark, what do you mean by that? Here's what I'm saying. Do we need to go back just a few years to the year 2008? The Great Recession. Retirements were wiped out. Savings were lost. Fortunes were lost in a matter of hours. In the 1930s, during the Great Depression, businesses closed. Fortunes were lost. In countries like 1930 Germany, money was worthless. There's a story about a a man taking a wheelbarrow full of money, going up to the baker to get some bread, leaves his wheelbarrow full of money there outside the, the shop, goes in to order some bread, comes back, and there's a pile full of money, and the wheelbarrow's gone. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, here's the point. Money is only paper with ink on it. Venezuela, other places have made it clear that inflation has made money almost worthless. So, Mark, what's your point? The point is this. Today, we're on the brink of another Great Depression. We're on the brink of seeing hyperinflation as money's being borrowed and printed, causing our economy to teeter on financial collapse. So, for money, it represents security, but be careful how much security you put in your money. Number two, money represents our success. Many shows, uh, money shows that, that we have accomplished. Money shows others what we have done. Mother, money shows others what we have accomplished. In other words, money shows other people that we've made it or how much stuff we have because of our money. And I can speak personally. I, I grew up with a dad who believed this. He believed that you were not successful until you drove a Cadillac. He spent his entire adult life scraping and saving and hoping and listening and borrowing and selling. So one day, just a couple of years before his death, he finally bought a Cadillac. And for him, he thought he'd made it. He thought he had bought the one thing that would demonstrate success in life. For some, money represents stability, that my world is stable as long as I have money, that my structure, my lifestyle is based on my money. Then Jesus comes along and says what? Do you really want to have what lasts? Do you really want to have blessing from God? Do you really want reward in heaven? Do you really want purpose in the lives of others? Do you really want to have an enriched faith? But most of all, do you really want to glorify God? Here's what Jesus comes along and says. He says that if you want these things, if you want what lasts, if you want true blessing, if you want reward, if you want to glorify God, if you want purpose and meaning in life, he says, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to give just some of your money away to the glory of God. Give some to that which honors God. And then Jesus says this. Listen, he says, if you do that, God, your heavenly Father, your Creator, God will see that and reward you. Now, here's my question, as some of you are already pushing back. What if we really believe that? What if we really, really, really believe that God in heaven notices and watches what we give? And will truly bless us and reward us, not only one day, but here and now. And not only here and now, but one day. What if we really believe that? What if we really believe that God does see us and God does reward us? That God really does bless us 
and rewards those who invest in his cause, in his mission, in his message. Here's my question. What if, just what if, we really believe that? Would it not change how we give? Would it not change how we view or treat our money? Would it not shift our belief as to what brings security and success and stability and structure? If we really believe that God does see us and God does reward those who invest in him. Here's my point. Giving is not a financial issue. Giving, ladies and gentlemen, is a faith issue. Well, Mark, where do you see that in the Bible? Go to Mark 12, 43. You know the story. The Bible says that Jesus is sitting outside the temple treasury, and he's watching what people give. And then a widow who has no social security, no insurance plan, no family to support her, gives everything she has. And Jesus, again, you know the story, makes it clear that he sees her and that she gave with the greatest faith of all. And Jesus notices this reality. Here's the point. When you invest in God's mission, when I invest in God's mission, here's what you're doing. You're including God in one of the most intimate areas of your life. When you invest in what God is doing, all you're doing and all I'm doing is that we are bringing God into the most intimate area of our life. And you're involving your Heavenly Father. You're involving your Creator. You're involving God in one of the most personal areas of your life. And what you're saying is this. You are trusting God, hear this, in the most fragile area of your life. You think about that. You're now involving God in the most fragile area of your life. That's part of what it means to have a personal relationship with him. And as you do that, here's what begins to happen. Your faith, my faith, shifts from trusting money for all the things that I want and need to trusting God for all the things that I want and need. This is why Jesus said what? You can't serve two masters, for you will love one and you will hate the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. So here's the question we must all ask. What are you trusting? What am I trusting? Am I trusting God or I'm trusting money? But Jesus doesn't stop there. He pushes another major button. It's kind of like, okay, Jesus, that's enough. You've talked about my money. You talked about my stuff. And Jesus goes, oh, I'm just getting warmed up. (laughs) He then starts talking about your time. How do we spend our time? Jesus is now asking the question, and he's making the point, how do you spend time with your Heavenly Father? Do you spend time with your Heavenly Father? Not just in worship, and that's wonderful, but he says, you know, when you're alone, he says, how do you pray? Now, again, I talk to people all the time, and this is my own personal experience as well, is that most of us will spend time in prayer while we're on the interstate, right? God, just get these cars out of my way, you know? Or, or, you know, or maybe we'll have a little prayer before the meal, you know, rub-a-dub-dub, thank God for the grub. I get it. These are the kind of prayers that we pray all the time, you know, and, or, or you, know, you know, God, I pray she calls me back, or I pray he calls me back, or I pray I get the job, or I pray, you know, God, just help me out here. God, you know, I didn't study for this exam, but please give me an A or whatever. We, we, we have those prayers. We, we know those prayers. But Jesus says, wait, what I'm talking about is this. I'm talking about, he says, when you carve out some time with your heavenly Father, Though you're a busy, busy person, when you carve out some time and you go into your room and you close the door and you begin to pray or study the Word and you enter into this fellowship with God, 
and you're saying to your heavenly Father, I am carving out some time to be with you. Jesus says what? He says, God sees you. And God rewards you as you declare to your heavenly Father how dependent you really are on God. And as you begin to do this, as this becomes a part of your life, you begin to see God move in your life. You begin to see God work in your life. And as you see God move in your life, as you see God work in your life, your faith begins to grow. And here are the results. When you are giving and carving out time with your Heavenly Father, here are the results. Here's what begins to happen to your life. Number one, you begin to have a new understanding of who you are. You're now more than your occupation. You're now more than a butcher, baker, or a candlestick maker. You're a soldier now in the army of God. You have a mission. And you realize, here's my mission. My mission is to see people know and receive the Lord Jesus. My mission is for people to have eternal life. My mission is to bring as many people to the knowledge of Jesus as I possibly can, whatever that may look like. That my life now is about investing in what Jesus is all about. It's about investing in what lasts for all of eternity. Next, as your faith begins to grow, you begin now to live, hear this, in a new anticipation of the return of Jesus. Here's what I know, and here's the point I want to make. I am listening and hearing people from every walk of life. Some who've been in church all their life, some who haven't stepped foot in the church in 35 years. Some who are believers in Jesus, and some, they're not sure what they believe. But here's what I'm hearing. This pandemic that we're all in, no matter who you are, something is now happening in the psyche of humanity. Something is now churning up. What's this all about? What's God doing? Is there a God out there? I hope there is now, because here's what's happening. When you begin to see what's happening in our world, as you begin to see what's going on in the light of the return of Jesus, this begins to make sense. When you begin to see what's going on in our world today, in the light of the return of Jesus, it starts to make sense that, yes, there is a pestilence out here. We are seeing government overreach. There are earthquakes in our land. There's economic shutdown happening. There are church closures all over the world. There is Christian persecution and perilous times are upon us exactly as the Word of God declared would happen in the last days. You begin to see things as your faith grows in the light of the return of Jesus. But here's the good news. When our faith is in our Savior concerning our time, when our faith is in our Savior concerning our finances, then we have a new confidence about our life. We have a new confidence about our blessings. We have a new confidence about the reward that God has for us. We have a new confidence about our eternity. When your faith is focused on your Savior, you now also have a new affection, a new way of expressing love. You know, one of the things that Jesus said would happen in the last days were this, was this. He said in the last days, one of the things, of all the things that he said, he said, people's love will grow cold. You've been in the Walmarts and the supermarkets, and you've been in other places, and yes, we want to social distance, and yes, we want to take every precaution, but how many of you have treated someone like a leper? How many of you have been treated like a leper? People's love. Jesus said, will grow cold in the last days. The Bible says love will cost you. That love cares. That love covers a multitude of sin. 
that love is the greatest testimony, the greatest motivator, the greatest virtue a person can have. Not only that, when your faith grows, you have a new willingness to serve. Peter says there's two general areas of serving. There are the speaking gifts and there are the serving gifts. The speaking gifts are preaching and teaching and counseling and singing and directing. And the serving gifts are building and preparing and fixing and cleaning and and maintaining. And all of this is done. All of this is done for the good of humanity and for the glory of God. So knowing that, we are called to have a faith that truly does bless others. Knowing that, we're called to have a faith in our Heavenly Father that blesses us. Knowing that, we are to treat our time and our money and those around us in a unique way as we give to God what's important to us, our finances and our time. See, we see God's blessing when we do this. We experience God's reward when we do this. We grow in our faith when we say, God, here's the most intimate part of my life, my finances and my time, but God, I am giving it to you. And when that begins to happen, we grow in our faith. And we grow in our hope, which is something we need in these days. And we grow in our love. Jesus made it clear. When you give God your most intimate part of your life, your finances and your time, your heavenly Father sees you and he rewards you. What would life be like if we truly believed that. May we pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will hear your word and grow in our faith as we apply your word. To pray this in Jesus' name, amen.